Would you like to move your city to somewhere warmer? No need. According to new science, that different climate will probably come to you. By the end of this century, some American cities will experience climates not seen before. Our tour guide is the lead author of a new paper published in Nature. Matt Fitzpatrick leads the Global Change and Biodiversity Lab at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. He is listed as the principal investigator with a team of scientists and over 50 papers published. Matt Fitzpatrick, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thanks, Alex. Happy to be here. My actual affiliation is the full University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, which is separate from the University of Maryland. Well, you're talking about kids today living in a city very different when they grow up. Can you give us a quick example of what maybe New York or Washington might be like around the year 2080? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, so we're looking only only at the climatic aspects, but in, in terms of those, you know, New York, under our current emission trajectory, by about 2080 is going to feel like uh, northeastern Arkansas feels today. So, you know, on a summer day, that's an average of about nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer. When a long winter hangs on like this one, a lot of my listeners would probably love to have a climate more like San Diego or Miami. Maybe global warming will be popular. What's the problem, they think? Well, yeah. I mean, I I had other people make that similar argument that, hey, you know, I'd love for the climate in my place to be to be warmer. And maybe, you know, uh, you hear a lot about the risks of climate change, and maybe that's one of the re- rewards. And so the, the question is, do those sorts of rewards, do those outweigh the significant risks? And the sorts of risks we're talking about are changes in our ability to grow food, changes in the magnitude and number of extreme weather events, sea level rise that's going to flood coastal cities, movement of people responding to climate change, right? We're talking about climate refugees, potential conflicts over water. So there's a whole host of negative consequences that come along with climate change. And so I think if people want to live in a warmer climate, they'd be better off trying to fight climate change and moving. We know that weather is different than climate, and the weather lately is sort of all over the place. It doesn't seem normal to some people, but humans, we can't see or feel the longer trend, the real climate change how is your work trying to help overcome that? Well, that's right. I mean, one of the, the most significant barriers, I think, to, to doing something about this problem is that we experience you know, daily, seasonal, annual variation in climate, and that can mask some of these trends that we've seen over time. And you know, the way that we're trying to combat that problem is to show people you know, climate at a place now that's going to be, that that best represents climate at a future time. And if, you know, someone has a general understanding about how climate changes uh, in North America or the United States, or they've traveled to these places or they've seen them on TV, that should give them a sense of the sorts of weather they might expect, even though we're not obviously forecasting weather in year 2080. And for the new study and the handy interactive map, which I've checked out, we can all use it, You and Robert Dunn used a tool called climate analog mapping. That word analog isn't a common word for most of us, and we certainly did not learn that kind of mapping in school. What is it? Yeah, so this is an idea that we didn't invent. It's been around for a long time, actually. And, you know, the basic idea is we're we're saying what place, what climate is most analogous or most similar to the climate expected at a place at another time. And so the the basic underworkings of how that goes is that we have observations of current climate, of course, and then we have forecasts of climate. These are 30-year averages forecasted from climate models. And we're just saying, you know, where uh, is there a place that is most similar to that forecast for that location? We do have listeners in Europe. How does your city study compare to the 2018 work Characterization of European Cities Climate Shift, led by Guillaume Rohat? Yeah, so that is a very similar study. You know, the ideas are basically identical. I think the only difference between the two is that we're using a slightly different statistical methodology to measure the similarities. And, of course, we're working in a different place and with... with um, different climate projections. Those are minor differences, but yeah, the idea is basically the same. 
Your research covered about 75% of the population of the United States and around half of the people of Canada, but I can't find a map for climate change in Canadian cities. Is that planned? Yeah, so actually, if if you go to the map, there are, I, I believe the number is there's 10 Canadian cities on the app that people can look at. Most of those are along the border with the U.S., because that's where most of the population of Canada is. But cities like Montreal, Quebec City, Ottawa, Vancouver, et cetera, are all uh, in the map. And do we get to go to San Diego if we're living in Vancouver? I, that's a good question. Um, Vancouver is interesting. A lot of the West Coast cities, they... Let, let me let me just have a look while we're talking here at Vancouver. I think Vancouver actually becomes a lot like Seattle, yeah. But there, the one really important caveat that I try to get across, and this this is a little bit technical, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do this slowly. So we're trying to find the current climate that's most similar to, let's say, Vancouver's climate, 2080. So like, where is the location that has a climate that's most similar? And we do that by looking at every single location in the map, in the study region we considered, in this case, that's the Western Hemisphere north of the equator. So we look at every location and we say, how similar is that location to 2080's climate in Vancouver? And then we find that the short, in essence, what's the smallest distance, the closest similarity. But that doesn't mean it's actually all that similar, right? And so what we see for cities like Vancouver is that there's really not a good match or there's a, it's a poor analog is what we would call that. And that means that the climate we expect in 2080 in Vancouver is actually unlike anything currently present in the study area that we considered. We call that climate novelty and in more, uh, you know, more common vocabulary, we would say that you know the combination of precipitation or rainfall and temperature doesn't presently exist in the study area at present. Yeah, I noticed that about the map. I mean, it seemed like various American cities in the east and the Midwest were pretty easy to understand, but the West Coast cities, in a couple of cases, you might have to go north to find an analog. And why is the West generally harder to understand? Well, the climate patterns are more variable in the West because of the topography, because of the influence of currents along the West Coast. And and elevation also plays a factor. So you mentioned some cities having an analog to the north. Um, and that's not uh, all that surprising. It, it's In essence, if you have a city that's at, if you have a, a city that's at a high elevation, its 2080s climate might match a lower elevation, right, that's warmer and drier today. And that might be happen to be north of the city. And so that's why we tend to see that in the western U.S. especially. Right. That makes total sense. So previously, one of the challenges of science was interpreting global data into a local projection. How did you drill down to the city level when previous studies and reports have had difficulty doing that? That's right. So, you know, the data that come out of these global uh, climate models are what we would call relatively coarse spatial resolution. And you might think of this as like, you know, take a map and chop it into um, into squares of equal size. And those squares are pretty big in, in terms of how the data comes out of the climate model. To get to the level of cities, we used data that had been what's known as statistically downscaled. So there's these techniques where they take the information from climate models, and they reduce the spatial resolution down. The equivalent process, one way to think about this is, is older digital cameras, right? The older digital cameras might have, you know, they might be like one or two megapixels, right? That's like the number of pixels in the image that you take. And whereas today's cameras might be 12 megapixels, let's say. Um, so in essence, that's what's happening is that we're well, we didn't do this work. This was done by an outside group. But they're taking these coarser resolution outputs from climate models, and they're statistically downscaling them to a more uh, fine resolution, and, and that's the data that we used. I did some digging around in the charts, and I was looking at Washington, D.C., and it appears to me from your paper, if we start from the period 1960 to 1990 as our baseline— the worst-case emissions scenario means that around March 2080 or so, Washington would be about 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer both days and nights and would experience an extra day of rain. Now, 
Matt, aren't we currently on the IPC worst case emissions pathway right now? Yeah, we're, we are. I believe um, we're either on that pathway or we've exceeded it or are exceeding it. Um, and so we're on track, given current emission rates and the speed of global action, to be in the worst case scenario. Matt, how did you account for the other side of climate change, the new hydrology, the new patterns of humidity and storms and extreme precipitation events which are hitting the U.S. right now? Right. So all of those um, factors we basically had to ignore. So we're, what we're talking about are 30-year averages of climate. So we, u- we use the term 2080, right, as the time frame we're talking about in the future. But what that actually refers to is the average of the period 2070 to 2099. So it's a 30-year average of climate. You know, we're not considering changes in the frequency of extreme events or any of those uh, sorts of things that come along with these changes. We're also not considering sea level rise. That's going to probably be potentially the larger impact for low-lying coastal cities. And we're not uh, considering things that are going to make the problem worse, like heat island effects, right? So the interior of cities are often several degrees warmer than the surrounding suburbs or countryside, uh, given the the large amount of buildings and that sort of thing that hold heat. So in a lot of ways, what we're showing here is conservative, potentially. We know warming is going to continue for centuries after 2080, and I'm wondering, should we consider the same study for the year 2180 if we're trying to weigh up the risks of what we're doing now? Or is that just too far out for us to even guess what might happen by then? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, they can certainly simulate climate out that far, and potentially people have. I'm not 100% sure. But, you know, th- this is one of the challenges of climate change is that not only are the effects gradual, they accumulate over time, and the severity of them becomes worse. But thinking even to 2080 is is more than I think we as humans are readily able to conceptualize. Even though it is the lifetime of our children, you know, we're more worried about what's going to happen tomorrow or next week than we are about things that are several decades away. And so, you know, to me, that's this is the sort of problem that really requires a policy solution because it has to change behavior now to have a benefit multiple decades in the future. And according to your recent work, most northern cities will have climate more like what is seen in the south more or less today. So what happens to cities that are in the tropics now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, You know, we didn't the closest we get to the tropics in our analyses are like southern Florida, and southern Texas, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a study that looked at a, kind of more of a global perspective. It wasn't looking at cities, but it was looking at the idea of what I spoke about earlier uh, about climate novelty. And it asked, you know, where do novel climates arise in the future? given climate change. And oftentimes, these novel climates are in the tropics because the tropics are becoming warmer and that sort of thing. And so what I would say about, you know, cities in the tropics, there's probably not a good current analog for what those places will be like in the future and that their climates will be unlike anything that we see potentially anywhere on Earth today. Well, it's possible in some places where the humidity is high enough that those cities may be empty and those people may uh, move north or south just to find a more habitable climate. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, humans have a way of uh, figuring out how to inhabit some pretty uh, extreme places. You can help Radio EcoShock keep going. Make a donation at our website, ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is Matt. Fitzpatrick, and he's with the Fitzpatrick Lab at the University of Maryland. His latest work lets you see the coming climate in 540 American cities. Matt, the majority of the world's population now live in cities, and megacities are still expanding. How vulnerable are big cities to a shift in climate within one generation? That's a good question. I mean, it's a bit outside of my expertise to think about it that way. Um, I mean, you know, the way that I think about cities and their vulnerability is that they're not natural environments, right? By their definition, they're heavily built environments. There's lots and lots of infrastructure in place to support population densities, transportation, et cetera. And 
so the extent to which those systems are or are not buffered from climate events could make those sorts of places very vulnerable to climate change. Thinking about city planning, even with your new map, you say cities can't just click on a future and plan for that because with climate disruption, well, how can city planners prepare for a variable future? That's a good question. I mean, part of our initial goal with this was to potentially provide some forward-looking information to people making planning decisions, like, you know, looking at if my city is going to become like this location, you know, what are their cooling needs in buildings and that sort of thing. Reviewers actually pushed back on us on that and said, well, you know, this method hasn't been demonstrated to be useful for that, and you're speculating, so we removed a lot of that. So, you know, I think it's an open question, the extent to which climate analog mapping can be used uh, for that purpose. But it should at least provide a sense of, you know, the sort of climate that these cities may experience, and that could translate into building codes and infrastructure development and engineering and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, again, I think it's a bit of an open question. So people click on the map at tinyurl.com slash climate. Perhaps they see what the future might look like for where they live, for their kids at least. Then we have to drive to work. Do we know if awareness really leads to action that will prevent a bad outcome with our climate? That, too, is an open question. It's one that we're very interested in pursuing here at the Appalachian Lab. Um, You know, we're curious about the use of a tool like this in terms of not just informing the public, but does it uh, change people's engagement or awareness and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I'd like to think it does, but the reality is we all have a lot of other things to think about. And again, that's where I think a policy solution is probably the best way to address this problem. Before we wrap up, Matt, I'd like to just take a peek at some of your other research. You are an expert in phenology. What is that, please? A lot of the work I do is related to the response of natural systems uh, to climate, climate variability, and what that tells us about how they might respond to future climate change. Some of my work uh, works on phenology, which is basically the timing of events in the natural world. That means typically, you know, phenology events are very prominent in the spring and the fall, right? So flowers are blooming, leaves are coming out, birds are arriving in the north. So these are all phenological events. And climate is a big driver of when those events happen. And when those, the timing of those events change, they often have ripple effects through ecosystems. So there's lots of examples of changes in phenology events impacting other aspects of ecological systems. I thought global warming was developing too fast for evolution to help species cope, but you study some kind of genetic adaptation. Can you talk to us briefly about that? That's right. So, like, you know, uh, these phenological events, let's just stick with, like, the timing that a certain plant flowers. That's often under very strong genetic control. Um, And given the new technologies in uh, genomics, we are able to look more closely at the actual genetic basis basis for the timing of some of these events. Um, And so I don't do any of the sort of nitty-gritty genetics work myself. Uh, I have collaborators that do that. My interest is more in taking those data and applying some of the modeling work that I do to understand um, what drives that variation within species, how is it related to climate, and can we use that to make predictions about how these events will change in the future. I worry about one more underreported story from your work, quote, aquatic ecosystems are considered among the most vulnerable and endangered in the world, with the projected future extinction rate of freshwater fauna rivaling estimates for tropical rainforest species. So we talk a lot about the rainforest, we worry about them, but we never hear about this serious freshwater extinction situation. We have been talking with Matt Fitzpatrick, head of the Global Change and Biodiversity Lab at the University of Maryland. On February 12, 2019, Matt and Robert Dunn published the paper Contemporary Climate Analogues for 540 North American Urban Areas in the Late 21st Century. They also gave America a tool to see the climate destination of their city.
Find that interactive map at tinyurl.com slash urbanclimate. I'll put links in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Matt, thank you for giving us a good look at what could be a bad situation. You bet, Alex. My pleasure. I'm Alex Smith reporting for Radio Ecoshock. At the end of last week, major cities in North Korea were threatened by wildfires. Early fires have already appeared in western North America. Songwriter David Rovix realized he is an early climate change refugee, avoiding the summer smoke in Portland, Oregon, for a coffee house in Denmark. But then, projections for rising seas show Denmark could disappear as a country as surely as low-lying Pacific islands. Nobody escapes global climate change disruption. Regular listeners can see all this coming direct from our breaking science. I'm Alex Smith. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned to your future with Radio EcoShock. I know we're creating a scene, but the creating a scene is not illegal. You are born free, you will live free, you will die free. You are allowed to make a scene. You're allowed to scream for joy. You're allowed to complain. You're allowed to cry. You're allowed to love people. You're allowed to hug people.